the Pickett-Spengler reaction. So the Pickett-Spengler reaction is a particular variety or variation of the Mannich reaction and it occurs between an aryl group, so an aromatic ring that is attached to an alkyl group and on the beta carbon it has a nitrogen, a primary amine can also work for secondary amines. So this reacts with an aldehyde or a ketone and we are going to use phenylethylamine and acid aldehyde to demonstrate the reaction and it occurs in the presence of catalytic acid. So your catalytic acid can be um, any of a number of acids. Paratoluene sulfonic acid often works well but there are lots of different possibilities. So nucleophile electrophile. In some cases you'll have to activate the electrophile with the proton first if it's a ketone, but if it's a reactive aldehyde then you can expect your nucleophile to attack. When you attack your carbonyl carbon you immediately make a tetrahedral intermediate. So we've made our tetrahedral intermediate Try out everything exactly as it was, except for the things that the arrows have moved. Drawing those hydrogens. This lone pair has now been put into a nitrogen carbon bond that had a double bond to an oxygen, now has a single bond to an oxygen, and it's still got the hydrogen and the methyl group attached to this carbon here. So we took that pair of electrons, put them in here, nitrogen is now positively charged, took that pair of electrons, put them up here. Right. Oxygen is now negatively charged. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing that happens when you're doing an imine formation, which you do on the way to a reductive amination, or indeed in a normal manic reaction, which is just transfer our proton to make our tetrahedral intermediate a little bit more realistic. Uh, it seems unlikely that you'd have an oxygen with a negative charge in the same molecule as an ammonium with a positive charge for any great length of time. So we'll transfer that, make the alcohol, make the amine, still have the methyl group, still have the hydrogen. And at the same time, we are also going to add in our uh, proton from our acid. So this is a classic situation. Here we have a tetrahedral intermediate. There are two possible leaving groups, so two heteroatoms that are capable of leaving, the nitrogen or the oxygen. And whichever we protonate is going to become the leaving group. We want the oxygen to leave. So let's protonate that oxygen and what we are going to have, and again all of these are reversible steps, so that can happen. Uh, they're all in equilibrium, but what we have after we protonate our oxygen on our tetrahedral intermediate is we have a very good leaving group attached. So this should be reasonably familiar. Here we have water ready to leave and attached to the same carbon that that water is attached to is nitrogen with the lone pair. So we're going to take that lone pair, form a new carbon nitrogen double bond so that we can kick out the water. And now what do we have? Well, in this case, let's dry out everything exactly as it was, same as ever except for the things that have arrows going from them. And we took this pair of electrons, gave it back to the oxygen, so it's no longer positively charged. And we took the pair of electrons that was on the nitrogen and we made a new carbon-nitrogen double bond. So now we have our iminium. Well, this confirmation is no good for drawing what happens next. But we have a strong electrophile and we have not a very good nucleophile but a nucleophile nonetheless. So we can do electrophilic aromatic substitution. So I'm just going to redraw this out in a different conformation. So one carbon, two carbons, then we have a bond to our nitrogen and then our nitrogen double bond to a carbon with a methyl group and a hydrogen attached 
and that nitrogen is still protonated, it's still an iminium. And now it's going to be attacked by the aromatic ring. So electrophilic aromatic substitution, I'm going to draw in these, or this hydrogen here, because it's going to be necessary to draw it in, it's going to attack and relieve the positive charge on the nitrogen. And what do we have? Well, this should look reasonably familiar. If you remember your electrophilic aromatic substitution, we've broken the aromaticity. And we took this pair of electrons here and we moved them into a new carbon-carbon bond here. And so this carbon here is positively charged because it was sharing that bond with that carbon, but those electrons are now over here. Well, in electrophilic aromatic substitution, the aromatic ring attacks an electrophile and then very quickly aromaticity is restored because you substituted this electrophile for the hydrogen that's going to leave. So we'll take that pair of electrons, reform the aromatic ring, and we're left with our final product. So try out everything except for what we have changed. So they are all still the same. Leave that lone pair in if you want. And that hydrogen is still there. And what we've done is we've taken that pair of electrons there, away from the hydrogen, put it into the aromatic ring, and so we've regenerated our H+. So this reaction is catalytic in acid. The H plus is regenerated, and so you only need a small amount of acid for this reaction to progress. You also, if you want the reaction to progress, need to take out water to ensure that the reaction goes to completion. This product here is called a tetrahydroisoquinoline. So, why is it called that, or where does that name come from? Well, this molecule here, which looks not dissimilar to naphthalene, but with a nitrogen, so kind of like pyridine is to benzene as quinoline is to naphthalene, this is a quinoline. So if you make the isomer of that by moving the nitrogen one around, you have isoquinoline. This of course is also aromatic. If you put in four extra hydrogens into this, tetrahydro, then you get tetrahydroisoquinoline. So this molecule here would have one, two, three hydrogens on the nitrogen containing ring. And then over here, it would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've added in four extra hydrogens. It's a tetrahydroisoquinoline. Okay, I hope that helps. If you have any questions, post them below or ask me in Moodle or class or email or any other way you want to get in contact with me. That's all for now. Bye.